you so much, sir, for that warm introduction and a very good morning to everyone who is present here. The task assigned to me is something which forms the basis of all the discussions we will have in the entire day. Because we are going to see what to do about diabetes in pregnancy, but what we need to understand is you can manage a situation only if you understand what is happening. So this is what I am going to do in the next few minutes. Starting with the classification of hyperglycemia in pregnancy, conventionally there have been a lot of confusions. So we all grew up understanding that gestational diabetes was the term that was used for any degree of glucose intolerance that was diagnosed in pregnancy for the first time, irrespective of whether she had it earlier, what she was not aware or whatever. So first time we were thinking of diabetes in pregnancy, we called it gestational diabetes. Irrespective of what was the treatment modality used, which needed insulin or not, whether the condition persisted beyond pregnancy or not. And pre-gestational diabetes was anybody who said, I have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes before pregnancy and then she comes and she is pregnant. ADA and DSP tried to bridge this gap and clarify. So what they actually said was, if you are diagnosing diabetes in the first pregnancy, most often she definitely has a degree of dysglycemia that was happening preconception. So that is why they labeled this as pre-gestational diabetes. And gestational diabetes was the term reserved exclusively for diabetes that was diagnosed in the second or the third trimester of pregnancy, which is clearly not pre-existing over diabetes. Now, coming back to India, a lot of confusion needs to be simplified, and this is where Dipsy has come in and taken the leadership role. Dipsy clearly understands that gestational diabetes actually represents a detection of chronic weakness and dysfunction and is considered just a stage in the evolution of type diabetes. And therefore, irrespective of anything else, what we need to understand is that gestational diabetes has to be any degree of dysglycemia with onset of first type of issue in pregnancy because irrespective of what you are doing when you are diagnosing, what is most important is you need to either prevent it or you need to manage it as early as possible and manage it. Now, the WHO and FIGO have currently come out with an umbrella term about hyperglycemia in pregnancy. This is when now they have tried to again make things a little more clear by saying, pre-gestational diabetes is any woman who knows that she's got type 1, type 2 or any of the other forms of diabetes and then she's getting pregnant, so that is pre-gestational diabetes. Diabetes in pregnancy is a new term that has been introduced. This basically encompasses all pregnant women where hyperglycemia is diagnosed for the first time in pregnancy, but if you look at the glucose levels, they meet the WHO criteria of diabetes in the non-pregnant state, and usually diabetes in pregnancy is best detected in the first trimester. So these are essentially women who maybe had pre-diabetes or some amount of dysglycemia before they conceived, or probably even had diabetes and were not aware, and this is where diabetes has been picked up in the first trimester. And of course, this makes life a little easier because gestational diabetes, again, like I said, is dysglycemia until any time in the antenatal period, but not expected to persist postpartum and we have ruled out that she did not have preconception dysglycemia. So I think this is the uh, classification that tries to simplify things as the gestational diabetes on one spectrum, pure gestational diabetes on the other spectrum, and then you have the first trimester first diagnosis as diabetes in pregnancy. So I think this classification should be very clear to all of us. Now moving on to the pathophysiology of hyperglycemia in pregnancy and I will you mainly to GDM. What we need to understand is before we understand what goes wrong, we need to know what happens in a normal pregnancy. So the entire aim of maternal metabolic change in pregnancy is to provide an uninterrupted nutrient supply to the fetus for its growth and energy needs. So the important question is why does the mother's metabolism change in a normal pregnancy? Of course, because there is a rapidly growing tissue transplant or the conceptus in her body. This conceptus makes some alterations in the maternal metabolism and hormones so that all the fuels and nutrients can be diverted towards the fetus to enable it to grow and develop. And this is facilitated by the placenta. So placenta actually has a role both in embryogenesis as well as the growth, development, maturation and survival of the fetus. How does it do so? By synthesizing steroids and peptide hormones that modulate and transport maternal fuels to the fetus. Now two important hormones have a very important role to play. 
Insulin, we all know, is an anabolic hormone and glucagon is a catabolic hormone and it is essentially a coordinated action between these two that maintains maternal plasma glucose. So what are the maternal metabolic adaptations that occur in a normal pregnancy? The idea is A, you need to develop anabolic stores in the early pregnancy, that means from 12 to 14 weeks, to meet the metabolic demands in the late pregnancy, that is at 34 to 36 weeks. So, in the first half of pregnancy, there is facilitated insulin action, and in the second half of pregnancy, all these placental hormones will create a state of insulin resistance, producing a state of thyroidogenic stress, which versus the hypoglycemia. So to put it very simply, in early pregnancy, all these hormones, estrogens, progesterones, result in PLS and hyperplasia, insulin secretion, producing a state of hyperinsulinemia in the body. Hepatic glucose production comes down. Tissue glycogen stores are being built up. So in early pregnancy, in a normal pregnancy, you will actually see an improvement in the insulin sensitivity. As a result, the metabolic change is basically a facilitated anabolism to kind of store the fuels for the baby to develop. Now, what happens in second and third trimester? I told you the glycogenic stress of the hormones. All of these eventually are contributing to an increase in insulin resistance. Thus, you see the alteration in adipokines occurring, you see the many markers rising. All of these eventually contribute to a massive increase in insulin resistance. And to compensate for that, there is hyperinsulinemia. So the body tries to almost compensate by increasing insulin secretion almost 200 to 250 percent times more in late pregnancy to keep the blood glucose levels to normal. So I'm just talking about the normal pregnancy. Now this one line by normal cycle actually clearly tells us why all these metabolic shifts are occurring. Because you need to understand, fetus needs its nutrition continuously. But the mother is not eating 24 by 7. So the fetus is actually a continually feeding water in the body of the intermittently eating mother. And all this while, fetus needs its nutrients all the time. Fetal plasma glucose has to be maintained for growth. So what will happen is when the mother is not eating, that means in the unfed state, what will happen is fetal glucose demand has to be met. So maternal metabolism will change to shunt all this glucose to the body of the fetus. Hepatic new glucogenesis increases and peripheral insulin resistance will increase so that all these fuels can be sent to the baby. As a result, in a normal pregnancy, you will see maternal fasting class of glucose is low and fasting insulin levels are high. Now, as the pregnancy advances, what is happening? This constant shift of glucose in fetus has to occur. So, the fasting class of glucose remains low in a normal pregnancy. Now, hepatic glucogenesis is also occurring. So, circulating amino acid levels are coming down because these are being utilized for gluconeogenesis. Now, we understand that proteins are very important for fetal growth. Now, we need to spare this protein for the fetus. So, this is the time when the maternal metabolism will switch its fuel. So, it will switch to the fat. This is where catabolism using fat becomes the main fuel source in a normal pregnancy. And that is why we say that a normal pregnancy is associated with accelerated starvation and ketogenesis. Now, when the mother is eating in a fat state, she is having a mixed meal. So, she is having protein starch, fats, everything. Now, what happens is, as a result of this, both the basal and the glucose stimulated insulin release is increased to take care of this fuel. So, the post fetal glucose load and the increase in insulin levels will blunt the alpha cells, glucagon secretion will come down. Now, all this extra insulin that is being produced, 60% compensation occurs in the because of the insulin resistance that is happening at the periphery. Remember, I told you, blunting of the gluconeogenic potential of the glucagon in the immediate post period of hyperglycemia will spare the amino acid diverted to the fetus for anabolic use for its growth, producing a state of facilitated anabolism in the fat state. After this carbohydrate is disposed, what will happen is the alpha cell responsiveness will again come back to this persistent hyperamino acidemia. This will stimulate at least that much of basic gluconeogenesis so that the mother does not go into a hypoglycemia. 
So as a result, what you see is maternal fuel metabolism in a normal pregnancy will be characterized by a state of accelerated starvation in the unfed state where she is using fat as a fuel and facilitated anabolism in the fed state. So this is the basic changes that I told you in the later half of pregnancy over these hormones that are increasing the inflammatory milieu that has been produced, massive increase in insulin resistance and as a result you will see these two metabolic shifts that are happening. And that is why we tell pregnant women not to fast. Because what happens is the changes in fasting that can occur in a non-pregnant woman who made the fasting of almost 72 hours, they are going to be accelerated in a pregnant woman. So within 17 to 18 hours of fasting, she can go into ketosis. And this is very, very important and that is why we say in pregnancy, a woman should not fast for a longer period of time. So this is the pattern of glycemia in a normal pregnancy. You will see a fast in a normal birth woman, around 71 plus minus 8 and a 2 hour value of less than 1 10. Now what happens in GDM? Simple. As the glucose levels are increasing, insulin levels have to increase. If the insulin levels will not increase, the compensation will fail and she will develop gestational diabetes. So it's as simple as this. But this may sound very simple. This is how the graph would look like. In a normal insulin resistance, peaks going up, compensation occurs, glucose levels are maintained to normal. But if the compensation fails, the increase in hyperinsulinemia is not able to manage the glucose levels, not able to take care of this, so gestational diabetes will develop, producing a state of relative insulin deficiency, which we say as more of an insulin resistance. So what happens in GDM? What is different? The background beta cell dysfunction forms the backbone of all this. So chronic insulin resistance already present in the body of the mother, background beta cell dysfunction, now what happens is the normal increase in insulin resistance that happens in every pregnancy is already occurring but here the beta cells are dysfunctional so the compensation will fail. So this is the primary reason why gestational diabetes occurs and of course we know about the inflammation and the adipocytokines also having a role creating a state of chronic inflammation in the body all of which contribute to development of gestational diabetes. So as you see here in non-pregnant insulin resistance is taken care of by the insulin secretion it is balanced in a normal pregnancy also as the insulin resistance is increasing so is the insulin secretion Increasing, so the balance is maintained, glucose levels are normal. But in a gestational diabetes, because of all these chronic beta cell underlying dysfunction and the adipocytokines and the inflammatory markers, the increase in insulin resistance cannot be met by a compensatory increase in insulin secretion and she develops gestational diabetes. So basically, you will see a normalities in at least three parts of your metabolism. A, like I said, the insulin resistance in the fat and muscle increased hepatic glucose production and impaired insulin secretion. So there is inadequate compensation and as a result, facilitated anabolism is reduced and starvation is hyperaccelerated. So the diabetogenic stress again produces a sluggish post-raise insulin secretion in association with the insulin resistance. So who develops medium? I think all of us understand this and I will not go into the details. You need to understand all these different things that you can see on your screen and we will discuss this later on. Produce GDM. Again, each of these risk factors, if the mother is already overweight, obese, her diet, saturated fat, refined sugars, red and processed meats, they are consistently associated with an increased risk of GDM. They directly interfere with insulin signaling, so it's not just the nutrients. There is a whole, now there are studies that show that saturated fat consumption interferes with insulin signaling, inducing inflammation and endothelial dysfunction, and that is why it's important for the woman to lose weight and eat a healthy diet. So friends, GDM represents a phase of chronic beta cell dysfunction. It is a stage in the evolution of type 2 diabetes. Now there are multiple mechanisms and pathways. I will not go into the detail because of paucity of time. But remember, like I said, there is already a background of chronic insulin resistance in the body, which reduces the glucose uptake by almost 54% 54, 54 in GDM. There is also expression and phosphorylation of downstream regulators of insulin signaling. On that, on this background of progressive increase in insulin resistance in pregnancy that occurs, there is a beta cell decompensation that is happening. So, when you see in this diagram, in a normal pregnancy, as the peripheral insulin sensitivity is normal, normal amount of glucose is being produced and her beta cells are pretty alright, so the compensation is occurring fine. 
Now, as she gets pregnant, what happens is the insulin sensitivity comes down, insulin resistance increases, but because the beta cells are not dysfunctional, there is an increase in insulin secretion, so the blood glucose levels can be maintained to normal and alpha pregnancy comes back to normal. What happens in gestation and I told you there is already some amount of impairment in the insulin resistance already present. Insulin sensitivity is already impaired. Plus, the beta cells are dysfunctional. So now when she gets pregnant, there will be a massive increase in insulin resistance. Insulin sensitivity will fall down. But the beta cells will not be able to compensate. And that is why the glucose levels will start rising. Again, there is a role of these neurohormonal networks that is now recognized in the pathogenesis of GDM. So the leptin levels have been associated with fetal macrosomia also. So these are all studies which have clearly shown that hyperleptinemia, the leptin resistance that is present, again has a role. And we know that when a woman is obese, you will see all these things happening. So again, and in a relationship between different neurohormonal networks has been seen with GDM. Again, Adiponectin levels are reduced in GDM women, we all know that. Role of adipose tissue, again, I will talk about the weight, the glucotoxicity and the lipotoxicity in the peripheral organs produced by increasing adipose tissue, plus the adipocytokines, the inflammatory markers that are produced, all of these induce insulin resistance and impair the signaling pathways. But microbiome is again another very important pathophysiological modality here. So the, the lower proportion of hermitutes and the higher proportion of parotelitia. So this is seen that there is an impairment in the gut microbes because of which the gut permeability is increased. So the inflammatory mediators from the gut enter the circulation promoting systemic insulin resistance in the mother's body. Again, increasing the glucose levels. Oxidative stress also has a role to play overproduction of free radicals and oxidative stress, inflammatory cytokines, all of these contribute to insulin resistance. So there are multiple pathophysiological mechanisms involved as you can see on your screens and we now know if the maternal glucose levels are high obviously they cross over from the placenta into the fetus as a result the fetus birth weight the birth weight of the infant that again has a very direct relationship with gestational diabetes you can see here and I'll just take two extra minutes. So the low birth weight on one end and again a macroscopic large for gestational age baby on the other end. Both of these are children who are predisposed to developing GDM later on if they happen to be females or developing diabetes if they happen to be males. Because you know on the one side you have undernutrition in the womb, on the other hand you have overnutrition. And this is the gentleman fetal origin of adult disease by Barker's hypothesis which says that Diabetes epidemic is not because we are after birth we are getting fat, it's because we are born with that priming. And this priming, what is gestational priming? It is a process where hyperglycemia or all these other stresses occurring at a critical or sensitive period of fetal development permanently change the structure, physiology and metabolism, predisposing these individuals to disease in adult life. So like I said, maternal overnutrition can also reduce epigenetic changes in the, baby, in the baby's body. When this child grows up, this child is already primed in her uterine to produce an increased risk of obesity, diabetes and CVD in the offspring. So intergenerational transmission can occur. So all these inflammatory insults, both at the level of placenta, adipose tissue and the skeletal muscle produce a state of placental dysfunction and nutritional dysfunction, enhanced inflammation and insulin resistance. So the baby also inherits the tendency to develop all these multiple NCDs. Maternal undernutrition, again like I said, the fetal programming that occurs, this baby catches up, is the environment that it gets post birth again it gets into the starvation mode when it is intrauterine once it is born it gets plenty it starts storing fat starts becoming obese so these NCDs adversely impact maternal health and poor maternal health increases the risk of NCD so it's very important that you start the control right before the baby gets pregnant. So this is the link between maternal health and the NCD burden. One side you have undernutrition, one side you have overnutrition. And the solution to this is a baby who is born of ideal weight, who has had a normal exposure in pregnancy. So friends, to conclude, pregnancy is a state of high metabolic activity in which maintaining glucose hemostasis is of utmost importance. 
it is likely that there are multiple factors, genetic factors, epigenetic factors, and environmental factors, all of which contribute to development of GDN. It's just not insulin resistance alone. All these mechanisms involved are complex and advance over a substantial period of time. However, in a majority of cases, it is basically the pancreatic beta cells that fail to compensate for this chronic fuel surfeit, leading to an increased amount of insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, increased supply of glucose to the growing fetus. So the insulin resistance is a result of combination of increased maternal adiposity and the insulin desensitizing effect of hormonal products of placenta and there is also evidence I show you of adipose expandability, low growth chronic inflammation, gluconeogenesis, oxidative stress, gut microbes, placental factors, all of them contributing to development of gestational diabetes. We are still in the process of understanding these processes. The understanding is still not complete. So a greater understanding of these processes eventually and the contribution to GDM is very, very important in order to develop effective treatments and preventive strategies. And like our mentor, our guru, Dr. Seshia says, GDM is the mother of MCDs in India. And to achieve a diabetes free generation, it's important to focus on the fetus for the future. And I'm sure a lot of us have heard him talking about the new concept part of the matter, primordial prevention which starts in the womb. So thank you so much. Keep your eyes open. There's a lot happening in this field. A lot of understanding coming in and that's very important for us to understand how we manage diabetes in pregnancy and whether we can actually do something even before the woman gets pregnant. Thank you so much.